Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Global History. I'm your host, Mr. Langella. So, guys, um, this is going to be talking mainly about the Neolithic Revolution, but I wanted to give a quick little summary of the Paleolithic ever, uh, era, really, um, because it's going to lead right into what we're going to talk about today. So let's jump right in. So as we talked about in class, right, the Paleolithic era really um, was considered the Old Stone Age or also considered the Ice Age. And the important thing to understand about this time period was that it lasted a very long time, right? 2.5 million to 8,000 BCE, okay? And the next era that kind of transitions from here is known as the Neolithic era. And this was considered a new stone age, and it happened from 8,000 to 3,000 BC, okay? Now, the big thing, all you have to really know about the Paleolithic age is obviously that there was a lot of subhuman groups. Uh, the, the inventions of tools and, and the founding of fire happened during this time. But the big thing about the people themselves was that they were nomads or they were being, they were nomadic, which means that they were always in search of, uh, uh, they were always moving and going where the search of food was always, okay? And they, what they did was they lived hunter-gatherer lifestyles. And what that means is that they hunt for their food and they gather herbs for their daily life. And that's how, that's all they did every day, okay? So with that being said, uh, we talked about, obviously there was a, a way of uh, way of culture, that there was Neanderthal, that there were Homo sapiens, but that is for last class. We need to now transition to the Neolithic age. Now, the way I usually start this class is I always have you guys de debate really the the advantages and disadvantages of both hunting, gathering, and agriculture. So let's just get started. So advantages for hunting and gathering. Firstly, you're nomadic, right? Now, you might say, well, how is this an advantage? Well, the advantage is that you control your own destiny. You can move from place to place without being tied to a specific area. And that could be a, a very big positive because now, if let's just say the herds have left, you can now leave, right? If the weather starts to get really bad, you can go. You don't have to worry about a home, you know, your family, you know, a, a, a uh, um, you know, your farm, you don't have to worry about all that stuff. You can be nomadic, you can move from place to place, right? You can travel, right? You can see all these new different places. This is when you have a home, when you have a farm, you can't do that. You need to stay and take care of it. But what, if you're a nomad, you can travel and go anywhere you desire, right? Um, you are resourceful. What, what does that mean? When you're resourceful, basically everything you use, everything you hunt for is being used for literally everything. So the, the animals you hunt, they're for food, they're for clothing, they're for your houses, they're for literally everything. They're weapons, right? They, 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 you literally can use them for absolutely anything that you desire, okay? And that's a really important aspect. That's a good advantage to have, right? Um, yeah, so you're not tied to one area. You can travel anywhere you want. You're very resourceful, right? Disadvantages. Food is scarce, right? That's a pretty big one. And the reason why this is important, guys, is because when you literally have to depend on the area to have food, you can go starving, right? You cannot have water. You you could die because of that. Um, you have to worry about getting food every single day. And that is a that is a big disadvantage when you look at it. Um, the other side, it's dangerous. It's a survival of the fittest type of game for when it comes to being a hunter-gatherer. You have to out-compete other groups and other animals for food. Um, and if you don't win, you die. That's really the kind of the basic thing. And on top of that, you could be hunted by other predators yourself, right? So these are all things that you can look at as being a problem, okay? Um, so now let's take a look at farming, right? So some of the advantages, right? So we said food was scarce in the other group. Well, food is not scarce in this. Okay, and what I mean by that is that the fact is you're all you're growing your food in your backyard, right? Instead of it now, you have to go out and hunt. You can just grow it in your backyard, and you have a constant source of food. And this is a big, this is really important. Okay, now with, with food being in excess, which means being you know abundant, you can do more things, right? Uh, more food, more food, less worries. The idea is that basically when you have more food, you don't have to worry about, you know, trying to find a meal that day. All you, what you can do is now you can do more activities, more hobbies, more interests that you never were able to do before, right? Normally in a, in a nomadic lifestyle, you are constantly hunting. You are constantly trying to gather herbs. You are worrying about what you're eating that day and what the next day holds, right? In a agricultural lifestyle or in a Neolithic lifestyle, 
you don't have to worry about those things because your food is in your backyard, right? You have the food at your house. Um, and that that is a very good positive. The negative when it comes to this is the environment. You're dependent on the environment, right? If you, let's just say you pick a, a, an area and then all of a sudden that area, the weather starts to kind of crumble and, and be, you know, rainstorms, ter- rainstorms, tornadoes, droughts, uh, all these different things that could possibly go wrong, floods, you are kind of screwed, right? Your, you, your house will be carried away. Your crops will be destroyed. You're kind of dependent on the weather being pretty good, right? And that is a, that is a big problem, okay? Um, you also have to defend your, your one location. Okay. You have to defend your one spot and people are going to be trying to attack you. And, and normally as a nomad, as a nomad, you can kind of move around anywhere you want, but as a farmer, you kind of have to stay put. Uh, and then lastly, the last disadvantage, um, that I would say was that you can't technically get up and go, right? Bad things happen. You can't leave. Not saying that you can't move, but the likelihood of you getting up, getting your farm, getting your all your belongings, and just leaving is very unlikely, right? You kind of have to stay put, and this is this could be bad if there is a, a you know a bandits or there's a, there's danger in your area. You kind of have to just deal with it, right? So when you take a look at the if you were a Paleolithic person, um, and you had a switch between being a hunter gatherer to agriculture, would you do it, right? So the arguments are really that if you want to be a hunter gatherer. Um, then you would look at the positives of saying that, well, you're a nomad, right? You are a person that travels, um, that travels on their own. They can, they can travel the world if they want. You can, they are very resourceful. You can kind of use the, the findings you get for anything you desire. Uh, there's nothing holding you back, right? And if you want to choose to be an ag- a farmer, then the advantages are really simple, right? I like to have food as a constant source. I get hungry anytime I want. So now I can go eat anytime I want. Um, and more food you have in your possession means I don't have to worry as much. I can go do whatever I want because I don't have to worry about finding a meal every night because I have it available to me. All right. So let's start with ta- with setting the stage about really going, really transitioning to a Neolithic period. So understand that the the main reason why the Neolithic uh, era had begun or Neolithic revolution had begun is because the weather started to get better, right? And that's the biggest thing. So the weather really helps. Heather, the weather increases, uh, the heat increases, right? And it allows really the snow age to finally end, which means that now the, the land is now able to have vegetation. It's allowed to farm and you're golden, right? And what the funny story between how they first realized that things can be farmed is uh, they were, there was a nomadic group of, of people. Um, and the women that had gathered all these herbs had kind of thrown away the last remaining seeds that they didn't need for their meals, right? Uh, in this one piece, uh, one patch of ground. So they leave, right? They go hunt somewhere else. On their way back, they end up showing back at the same area, and all of a sudden they realize that all these new plants and vegetables and and fruits were now being grown in the areas in which they were. And they remember that the previous time they were there, that they there was not as many pre before. So they started to realize that if you put the seeds in the ground and there's and there's water on it for them, then this could lead to more and more of these being grown, which is now a kind of a breakthrough in history, right? They, they shifted from being a food gathering society to being a food producing society. And as I already mentioned, the rising temperatures were a major reason why this happened, um, because now Paleolithic was always a ice age. It was impossible. There was very short growing seasons. There was no way in which people can can farm consistently during the Paleolithic age. But now the Neolithic age, where the temperature increases, um, allows for this to, to happen on a daily basis. Longer growing seasons mean that a lot more crops, which means population grows, right? And what, what, how does that happen, Mr. L? Well, I'll tell you. Well, the reality is when more you have more food available to you, people get more nutrients, which means when they get more nutritional value, more vitamins, they live a lot longer than normal. When they live a lot longer than normal, it means that you know life is stable, more people are being born, and the population is going to increase over time. A constant food source makes life a lot better, and that means that more people are transitioning to being farmers. 
Okay. One of the first methods that they used to transition into farming was a slash and burn farming. Now, technically what the slash and burn farming really is, is they clear all the trees, all the grass, and they burn it, right? Why do they burn it? Well, when they burn it, it turns into ash, and this ash gets seeped into the soil itself, right? And what it does is actually a natural fertilizer, right? It naturally helps that grass or that soil kind of grow better back, all right? And it allows now that soil to be rich with nutrients from the previous trees that were there and the grass that was there. And it allows for the land to be used for farming, right? Now, one of the big things that they also learn is that they can't farm in the same piece of land for too long. And not saying that they did this right away, but a lot of the people use a system called a two-field system. And what a two-field system is, is let's just say there, there's two uh, lots of land. Right? We have A lot of land and the B lot of land. Right, One year, they farm on lot A, and they leave lot B by itself. They don't touch it. So then the next year, when they have to decide right, where, where they're going to farm, they're going to do lot B, and they're not going to farm on lot A. And the reason why is because if you farm too much on one piece of land uh, constantly, that land itself will turn into dust. If you ever heard of the famous event called the Dust Bowl, Right. The Dust Bowl is a time where in the South, they were farming so much on this piece of land because they wanted to make as many products as possible that the land itself turned to dust. And a giant windstorm came in right, and basically blew all the dust in the air, and now there's a giant cloud of dust being transferred across the nation during different times, right? which is pretty crazy. The other major thing that happened was the, dom the, the domestication of animals, right? and this is huge. right? The, the reason why – First off, domestication animals basically means you're taming wild animals to kind of be not like pets, but to really help you in your daily life. And the reason why this is important, guys, is because instead of how hunting for these animals, you now have them in your backyard as well, right? Now, granted, they wouldn't just kill one every day. They would allow them to kind of live and, and, and breed and have more and more of them so that if the day comes that animal becomes too old, they end up slaughtering the animal to, in order to have a meal, right, or to have a meat meal. Um, on top of that, they used all these animals to help them farm the daily life. So they would have cattle to help them pull plows, which would make now farming a lot easier and quicker to get done, which means that they had more time to do other things. Now, when we look at the major areas in which farming started to really emerge in the beginning, Africa has, you know, the Egyptian, the, the really Egypt civilization along the river valley of, of the Nile, right, which is going to be one of the first things we talk about. There is also other places as well, especially in Asia, where we look at China. We're going to talk about India, right, and then we're also going to talk about Mesopotamia. So these are going to be the big four, right, the big four that we're really going to be talking about. But there are also other places as well. Mexico Central and Central America had also civilizations that sparked there. Peru also has civilization sparked there. And we'll talk about all these different civilizations within this course. But the big four that we're really going to talk about first, the original River Valley civilizations, are going to be Egypt, China, India, and Mesopotamia. So if you take a look at this map, uh, basically right here, these are the four places I'm circling. Um, okay. Okay. So we have obviously Egypt here. We have obviously uh, Mesopotamia here. We have the Indus River Valley. In India, and we have China. All right, so we're going to talk about those. And as you can see, all these places are green and yellow. They all have places that were farming, but the red show you the density. This is where the majority of the new civilizations were being sparked. So one of the examples here was, is this place called Katahayak, which is found in Turkey. Now, the reason why this is important is actually in your textbook. This village showed really all the benefits of, of really in a settled lifestyle. First off, it really shows how really climate can affect the area. It allows for food to be produced at a large rate. Um, it also talks about how when you have more food, you have less problems. And one of the benefits of having more food is that you can now focus on doing other things, including trading with other organizations or really – sorry, not organization, but civilizations in other cities. Right. On top of that, they also realized that with more time, they started to get into the arts. Right. They started having pot, – making pottery, uh, painting paintings, making jewelry creating new and exquisite types of tools and having their own sense of culture. 
And then lastly, they started to see more traces of religious belief starting to occur. And the funny thing is, after all this, a writing system starts to be developed. And now we finally start to transition into history. Not prehistory. No prehistory. Just history. All right? And this is a big, big, big transition. All right? So with that being said, let's jump into the worksheet. So what basically what the worksheet is, guys, is a Microsoft form. What you're going to do is fill out your name, your last name, first name, period, and you're going to answer the questions that go along with these documents. Okay? All right, guys. That's it for me. Langella out.